And we're back now with Roy Reed, all back now online anyway. You, you noted, or I, I gathered from the, what I drew from the book is that one of the things was that uh, as I discovered, uh, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I've never had to deal with, I don't think anybody like a Bull Connor or a Jim Clark or any of the others that you dealt with on a, on a daily basis. But, but, uh, but you did note Amos Guthridge, for example. And it was always um, grimly amusing that some of some of the worst Southern races could be, even violent, even deadly people, could be, when they chose to be cordial, even charming, un until pushed. I'll tell you about one such man. His name is Tom Coleman, and he worked in the courthouse. Uh, in Lowndes County, Alabama, down the road from Selma. And uh, another reporter, and I, he, he was Nicholas Von Hoffman, working for the Chicago Daily News. There was a break in the story in Selma one day, and he and I drove to, to Hainville, uh, county seat of Lowndes County, uh, just to look around. Walked into the courthouse, it happened to be lunchtime, and the offices were, I mean, we, they were empty. But we heard voices in the back, and we went back there, and this, this man got up to ask us if he could help. Courtly is the only word to describe the man. He, his speech, this was very hard to, to, to try to make credible in the book when I described this scene. But his speech reminded me of Franklin Roosevelt's. There was something about the way he spoke, kind of an aristocratic manner in his speech, that put me in mind of Franklin Roosevelt. And he was of the, the landed class in Lowndes County, this man Coleman. He was also a kind of unpaid deputy sheriff, which allowed him to carry a, a gun. He showed us around the, the old courthouse, told us the history of it, very interesting. We spent a, a, a very pleasant hour with old Tom Coleman. Days later, this same Tom Coleman walked up to the, uh, the front porch of the local grocery store and shot to death a young white man who had come down there with the Civil Rights Movement. She just shot him in cold blood, killed him. And of course, he was never penalized for this because this was Lowndes County. And when he came to trial, they they very promptly acquitted him. But he was he he featured your the definition of courtly. He was a, a, a Southern gentleman. That he was capable of murder. At the same time, you are um, covering or trying to cover. Uh, uh, <coughs> fairly murderous, they weren't fairly, I mean they were just potentially murderous types. You note also in the book that there was a substantial, always has been a substantial portion of the white middle class I suppose in, uh, in the South that would dare not use the N-word in public mm -hmm. or, or around other people but privately mm -hmm. would yeah. slip into that, that language yeah. and, and reflecting a, a deeper mindset, mm -hmm. perhaps. I like to think that, uh, that that is very much less the case nowadays. I I'm thinking my people, Roy, they would, slap, they would backhand me if I used the N-word. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When uh, we were growing up, when we were young people yeah. and far into the future of, of those times. Uh, but now, I, I suspect that well, I don't know. I, I I no longer run with folks who who would be inclined to talk that way, so I can't really say. But but I there there I I, sh I should make the point that cause I've I've been pretty hard on on white Southerners in a general way in this book. <clears throat> but I I also tried to point out that that a majority of white Southerners, even back in the 50s and 60s would not kill a man for their beliefs. 
they, they had a hold of these beliefs. That is, that that black people were inferior, maybe, or if not that, that they just went along with the crowd and said, well, yeah, segregation is the way it ought to be. It, it was only a really a very, very small minority of white Southerners who were willing to resort to violence over their their principles, if that's the word. Only a tiny minor, minority, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. And of course, that tiny minority drove the story because it, you know, it, 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 it would be a one-day story if, if uh, say, 65% of white Southerners all got together and announced, we're not for killing black folks. You know, uh, it, it's that other one or two percent who, who are willing to cross the line and be violent, and maybe, maybe not even to the extent of, of killing, but beating uh, or other ways, other forms of real abuse. Only a tiny minority, and, and I think that needs to be made clear. In your travels across the South and in, in your long days covering the movement, at the height of, of the violence. I wanted to, uh, with the possible exception of the legendary Sam Bowers, a, 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 an infamous Klan leader. I mean, he was the White Knights of, of, of uh, Mississippi, I believe, was one of the most fearsome Klans. And yeah. so, in your days covering that beat, did you ever, did you ever find a, did you ever see a rich Klansman? Did you ever see an affluent Klansman other than maybe Bowers? My impression was always that they were the, I think hard, there, yeah, I think there are very from. few, and he was the exception. I think he might have been a, a grandson of a congressman or something like that. I mean, he was not rich; he was a small business owner. But and there were <clears throat> there there were more than a few like that. I, I, I'm thinking now of Bogalusa, Louisiana, where the Klan for a number of years ran the town. I mean, they had some other folks who were not Klan, but the people who, who really behind the scenes ran things were members of the Klan. <clears throat> and they included an automobile dealer, a, uh, well, I can't come up with the right now, but a number of substantial business people in the town. And they all got called out uh, in federal court before it was over with for their activities and um, kind of in fact it got it got pretty funny they uh, things got so hot for the Klan that they changed the name of it I, uh, something like Southern I forget what what any communist league yeah any communist league and, and, the, and the grand Titan explained that you know they were blaming the Klan for everything we had to change for public relations reasons we had to Change the name, but yeah, there were a fair, fair number. Now, but most of them were. Uh, I, I don't know how to put this without sound, sounding uh, s snobbish, but they were not of the better class of white southerners, uh, and a lot of them, though, church-going people, considered themselves good citizens but got caught up in this madness. I, <clears throat> a, a pretty good little portrait of, of the Klan was provided to me by an old FBI, retired FBI agent named Floyd Thomas down at El Dorado. El Dorado. And one of his jobs when he was sent to El Dorado to be the FBI agent there was to take care of the Klan, which was running wild down there for a while, uh, burning crosses and you know, you know terrifying black folks, and uh, and he handled it in an interesting way. He he called it his interview program. He he uh, he had a paid informant or two who would give him the the membership list of the local Klan, and it was uh, several dozen men. And he went down the list. I don't know that he did it alphabetically, but <laughs> but he managed to interview a, a large number of those Klansmen. And he would explain to them that uh, uh, 
I don't know if you're familiar with the law or not, he would say, but uh, if, if, uh, if you're a member of this organization and your organization burns down a house, you might not even have been there that night, but you would be just as liable as the guys who actually did the burning. And he said, go a step further, he said, if there happened to be somebody in that house and they burned to death and a murder's committed, you, you're, you know, you can be brought up on a murder charge, even though you weren't there. And after he explained the law to them, one after another, they just kind of dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> they struck me as less interviews than they did. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of <laughs> yeah. He called it an interview program, but it yeah. was very effective. You note in the book, or you, you <clears throat> say in the book, that uh, you, you'd been away from the race beat for a time, or maybe away from the South. You, you, they did give you a break. They'd ship you to Montana, TDY, or California, or Maine, mm -hmm. give you a little breathing room. In it. But when you came back to the Atlanta Bureau, or New Orleans, where you were also posted for a while, uh, you write, the race story never stopped. You could get away from it. I mean, that's right. The times right. would change. The calendar, the pages would turn. Yeah. But the race story never stopped. Has it? Do you get the sense that it that it's slowing? To to mean is it less important now than measurably less important? I suspect that if you're a, an African American in the United States, the race story will never be over. But certainly, it's it's a far different story now than it was in the 1960s. I, I, I moved on to other things at the end of the 60s, and pretty much stopped covering the race beat. Uh, but I know that uh, it uh, it might have become outwardly different, but it still went on. There was still enormous <coughs> bias in the country. Uh, showed up in uh, in the jobless figures every year, I and mean, we still see that. You go to any large city, if it has a uh, an unemployment rate of of ten percent, uh, the the white part of that ten percent will be negli negligible, and unemployed young black men will amount to maybe twenty five or even fifty percent in some cities. So it, it, it's still with us, and I don't know what, <clears throat> whether it ever will end. Um, probably not in my lifetime. But it, it lacks the volatility that it had uh, during what we call the civil rights years, when violence was uh, such a big part of it, and non and nonviolence. We mustn't forget the nonviolence, because that was that was the device that was used to, to do away with the violence. Martin Luther King never would have succeeded, in my estimation, uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if he hadn't been able to rely on the stupidity of, of his enemies, who would provide an episode of violence as regular as, clo as clockwork. And every time there was a new outbreak of violence, he was there, arousing his people to answer this violence with non-violence. And, and the people who responded knew that they were liable to get their heads busted, or their houses burned, or and even did. killed. Yeah, and did. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but he he turned non-violence into a, a very active instrument of social justice. You were there, Roy, when uh, there began to be tensions within uh, the movement. That not everybody became convinced that, uh, that, that nonviolence within the <coughs> movement became, or people of color, began to, to doubt whether nonviolence was the, if not the best way, the only way. And that threatened to fracture. And, it, and it did. And uh, it caused a real division. And uh, I think that division has pretty much disappeared by now, but for a number of years, well, I, I, I describe a meeting with a young man named Stokely Carmichael, who was one of the more charismatic and visible members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, charming young man. 
and he was jailed about 30 times during his career, and it finally embittered him. And, uh, and, and he himself never resorted to violence, but some of his buddies just announced, I'm through with nonviolence. Uh, I'm going to carry a gun, and, and they did. Um, I'm thinking of, of one of his lesser known colleagues in SNCC, as we call it, a young man named Willie Ricks, uh, who in fact was the real author of the slogan, Black Power. Stokely got credit for it because he happened to enunciate it on a particular night where the TV cameras were running and all of us national newspaper reporters were there. And so Stokely got credit, but the fact is it was Willie at some little old forgotten town months before who had stood up in front of a, a, a congregation in a church, a civil rights meeting, and says, what this movement needs is black power. And it got an enormous reaction. And the other young folks there noticed that, and they picked up on it. And Stokely made it famous, but Willie was the real author of it. The last time I saw Willie, he was sitting in my car in Atlanta, and he had already uh, turned against nonviolence, made no bones about it. There was a kind of a routine demonstration going on in Atlanta, and there was a break in it, and I was sitting in my car, and Willie saw me and came in, and the air conditioner was on, he needed to rest, and we were sitting there talking about just stuff, and, uh, and he started talking about uh, the end of nonviolence. And he said, I have to tell you, Roy, that when the revolution comes, and it's coming, if I ever see you in the sights of my gun, I'll pull the trigger. We talk about a conversation stopper. You know, what do you say to that? Okay, Willie, thanks. You know. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and there were a, a fair number of people like Willie Ricks who saw no future in nonviolence. And they acted on it uh, occasionally. The Deacons for Defense and Justice got tired of having the houses burned and crosses burned in people's yards, and they organized to put a stop to it. And they very visibly carried guns, and they used them from time to time. A deacon shot a, a I think it was a Ku Klux Klansman one time, nearly killed the feller. Uh, but they, they, were, they were very capable of violence in reaction to this. But nonviolence, you know, was really the thing that, that carried the day and, and transformed the American South. You were, I'm, I'm going to plead with the control room to give us just a little more time. <laughs> you, or whatever, whatever his uh, political, social, cultural transgressions may have been, whatever one may think of, of LBJ, you write admiringly, uh, I think it's fair to say, of his, of President Johnson's resolve and here he was, a son of the South, uh, but who, who had engineered the passage of the incredibly complex passage of the Civil Rights Bill. Yeah. And, and he wouldn't, <clears throat> when they needed him, he was there. That's right. An old, old buddy of mine once said to me, aside from Vietnam, and that's a hell of an aside, yeah. <laughs> and that's true, but, but on domestic matters, he was clearly the best president of my time, uh, right up there with Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I mean, he and and he was absolutely a friend of of people of color, and he and a Texan who sounded like a Texan. Terrible accent, you know, and crude in his language, and but but he felt deeply the the uh, uh, inequality. Uh, that was vested on, on black people in this country, and he determined he was determined to do something about it, and he did. Uh, starting back when he was majority leader in the Senate, twisting arms, he was he was ruthless. Uh, he'd get what he wanted, no matter what it cost some other poor senator. <laughs> Same way as president, he'd call people up to the the Oval Office and twist their arms and cuss them out, mm. uh, and get his way. But in, in, as far as civil rights was concerned, 
he was absolutely on the right side and should go down in history uh, as a friend of the civil rights movement. Troops, if you, if you needed troops, you got them. If you needed the guard federalized, he'd do it. Yeah, marshals, yeah, FBI agent, yeah, ship them in there and get the job Absolutely, done. yeah, yeah. Um, you, you write that, um, of course, in the interest of time, we, we, we got to skip over your time in the Washington Bureau and maybe uh, your time in the London Bureau. And that's, but you, you, I, I note that, that you note, j journalists, reporters tend to make at best mediocre novelists, that, uh, the, that the shrewd among them uh, stick to nonfiction. Right. So what's next? Well, uh, for you, uh, for me, yeah. Uh, well, there's I may this, be done with writing. I don't know. Well, but, there's uh, this. Pardon me, but in your preface here, there's some, if I may say so, crap. The only uh, thing old men are good for is telling stories. I am old and full of days. They push me to the ground like a summer sun. Yeah. Well, Everybody who knows you and loves you wants another book. So what's next? Well. <laughs> I would like to think that I've got some more words left in me, but uh, but as far as books go, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. I write an occasional obituary for the New York Times, <laughs> and those are fun. No yeah. kidding, they're fun. Yeah. But uh, serious book writing, no, I think I probably won't tackle any more of that. Roy Reed, thank you for this time. Thank Once you. Once again, the book is Beware of Limbo Dancers. Please don't miss it. Good night.